five, four, three, two, one, zero. Una delle novità che abbiamo quest'anno a Maker Fair è un'ampia sezione dedicata all'arte contemporanea eh, e al suo connubio con la tecnologia e la robotica. Eh, abbiamo chiamato uno di questi artisti che si fa per raccontarci la sua storia, viene dall'Argentina, Joaquin Vargas. Parliamo di Roma, 
e abbiamo, abbiamo tre testimonianze di realtà innovative della città di Roma e quindi io eh, vorrei dare la parola a Barbara Mancutulli che dalla pandemia ci aiuta a raccogliere queste testimonianze. Grazie Alessandro. Eh, sì, parliamo di Roma e parliamo di una Roma diversa, parallela a sì, assolutamente. Parliamo di una Roma che è sicuramente molto diversa da quella delle narrazioni che più frequentemente raccontano questa città. Normalmente quando si parla di Roma si tende a indugere in quelli che sono i suoi assi più tradizionali, più, più noti, quindi comunque quello istituzionale, eh, il bellissimo clima, l'ottima cucina, l'offerta artistica e culturale. Roma è innovazione, la facciamo noi qui stasera, la facciamo da domani a Mega Ferro, la fanno soprattutto da tantissime eh, realtà che a Roma hanno scelto di eh, sistemare la loro sede, la loro base, e ne abbiamo qui diverse, come segnalare stasera. C'è qui con me Marco Colletti. Marco è il fondatore di Translated, che è un'azienda uh, internet based specializzata in traduzioni. È una delle aziende più importanti al mondo in questo settore, che ha tra i suoi clienti anche nomi come Google o come Amazon, per intenderci, e comunque tutti di quel calcolo. Uh, Marco è anche il founder di Campus, che è un fondo che motiva gli investitori internazionali a uh, investire in progetti di eccellenza di eccellenza di intelligenza artificiale a scelte italiane. E Marco, tu qualche tempo fa hai fatto una affermazione molto interessante. Hai detto o cambiamo il contenuto o cambiamo le traduzioni. E io so che questa affermazione in realtà si riferisce al ragionamento sull'intelligenza, quella umana e quella artificiale. Lascio spiegare meglio questa. Bene, grazie di venire tanto, è sempre un grande piacere essere qui a me. È vero, ci sono, nel mondo della traduzione, sono molto dei professionisti, bene. esiste perché la curva costa meno che generare del mondo. E mentre stiamo allenando macchine a tradurre, eh, il mondo sta anche allenando macchine a produrre. Perché non ci dormo un po' la notte perché se devo no, lavorare più sulla creazione di contenuti o su sistemi in grado di, di, di tradurre. E quindi questa alternanza che è interessante, è sicuramente uno dei due sistemi che ci Questa metafora insomma, si apre a molti altri campi eh, dell'industria, non solo quella della produzione. È un, Grazie, grazie Marco Tomberti. Grazie. E ora continuiamo a parlare di Roma perché dobbiamo fare un annuncio, dobbiamo rinunciare i vincitori di un concorso che riguarda proprio la nostra città e io vorrei chiamare sul palco la presidente di Acea Micaela Castelli. Grazie, Presidente. Che cosa possiamo dire? Innanzitutto grazie, perché se ne è 
sì, 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 i miei soci e collaboratori di Francesco e Giampiero, tutti quelli che lavorano eh, al nostro studio e li vorrei citare tutti su 40, tutto va bene, magari no, eh, immagino, immagino dopo, però eh, almeno voglio far arrivare diciamo, eh, il mio ringraziamento e la consapevolezza che so quando loro lavorano e eh, gli impegni che loro mettono ogni giorno nel raggiungere eh, quelli, quelli che utilizzi con più di innovazione, qualità dei progetti che facciamo, quindi mi prendo assolutamente tutto loro. Eh, il progetto, come detto al presente, non va svelato, ma invitiamo tutti all'inaugurazione delle, eh, delle luminarie e noi l'abbiamo approcciato al, al bando, al, al, al progetto, come quando eh, lo fanno studio di architettura, perché noi siamo, siamo questi, siamo studio di architettura e ingegneria, che utilizza le nuove tecnologie per dare per mettere al centro il lume per migliorare i propri eh, progetti. E, però siamo partiti con questa idea che ha detto può magari anche un'installazione eh, di luminarie natalizie e dare un punto in uno scatto d'orgoglio alla, alla città di Roma e ai suoi abitanti. Secondo noi insomma ce n'è bisogno in questo momento. E lo facciamo attraverso eh, la narrazione della storia delle persone che hanno fatto grande Roma. Ed eh, è una storia che, che è importante raccontare, non è nostalgia, è cultura e, e quindi va, va, va ricordata. E per noi questo è importante, Roma è questo, è, è, è tutto quello che ci circonda, ma è anche quello che sta. E lo rivedremo all'interno dell'installazione. Lo abbiamo fatto con un taglio di una linea, quindi abbiamo scelto tecnologie eh, che hanno reso il, il progetto sostenibile, eh, con una impronta ecologica molto, molto contenuta. Eh, che utilizzano fibre ottiche, eh, che utilizzano schermi LED eh, e che riesce, riesce il progetto a contenere un risparmio energetico di circa il 45% rispetto ai vecchi sistemi. Questo per noi è un risultato molto importante. Eh, ci sarà anche un'app eh, con la quale in realtà aumentata eh, ci fornirà delle informazioni supplementari che racconteranno sicuramente la storia della città di Roma, ma anche tutti i progetti che la CES sta portando avanti e concludo, concludo solo dicendo che insomma, la meta è una società che opera dal 2007 e che cerca di mettere al centro l'uomo nel rapporto con le tecnologie. Meta è un acronimo che viene da un'accademia eh, di, di architettura mediterranea, quindi per noi il discorso sul Mediterraneo, specialmente in questo momento, è molto importante e credo che è un, è un discorso del coinvolgo di e quest'anno è un, un Natale innovativo e nel corso scopriremo quali saranno le di quest'anno. Fatti virtuali. <ride> grazie. Grazie, 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 grazie. Uh, C'è cioè, una testata online che ispira molti maker, forse tutti i maker, e che quotidianamente viene letta da tutti noi alla ricerca di nuove idee, di quelle che lei dice a capo, quindi al, perché non ci ho pensato prima, perché è veramente, è veramente brillante. È, è venuto qui con noi il suo direttore, la testata si chiama Hackaday e lui è Mike Stish. Thank you. 
those 15 years, we've published 35,000 articles. We've had 900,000 comments come in. And I like to think of Hackaday as a common link in the collective brain. Uh, another place you can find uh, an interactivity with this huge worldwide group of people from different diverse backgrounds is to Hackaday.io, where you can find 350,000 articles who have posted 30,000 projects. It's great to go there and get inspiration from these and see how people are doing things. It's great to use this as your engineering notebook so you can pick back up your projects. Um, and incidentally, one of the slides going by here, every week we have a hack chat where we're bringing industry experts like NASA engineers who have landed hardware on Mars, um, and you know, people are designing software to, to develop PCBs. But um, we just happened, Sarah gave the opening talk on diabetes, and we just had Dana Lewis host uh, a hack chat yesterday. She's the person who invented the open source artificial pancreas. So interesting people from all backgrounds there. Um, but it, it gives me a special perspective to have been with Hackaday for 10 years now, to see this stuff every day. I'm just looking for these things that people are working on. And sometimes I've clued in to certain people and I see how the products that they've done and the making that they've done and the communities they've interacted with impact their lives in special ways. I don't have a ton of time to go into every one of the case studies that I've prepared for this talk. If you're interested in hearing more of them, I'll be giving a full talk on Saturday at 4.45. In, uh, in Hall 6, but I'd like to touch on just a few of them. Um, this is absolutely my favorite hacker in the world. He goes by Sprite TM, his real name is Gerard Donker. And I started seeing him do amazing things like this hard drive broke, and he thought, there's a microcontroller on there, what can I do with that? No documentation, didn't even know what shit it was, ended up writing his own firmware and made that hard drive do things that it shouldn't be able to do. If that's not flashy enough for you, he did things like took his gaming keyboard and rewrote the firmware in order to play Snake on it. He made the world's smallest Game Boy. It's, uh, he designed the case for this, he designed the circuit that's inside of it, he made the software work on it. And when this chip came out, this little Wi Fi chip, $3, that was kind of revolutionary for the maker world, he said, you know, that chip is Wi Fi, it's wireless, we shouldn't be able to write new software to that without connecting anything. So he wrote a library for that. And the company that makes that chip, Espresso, took notice and they ended up hiring him. From the Netherlands to Shanghai, and he's a software engineer and technical marketing manager there now. And I said, it's amazing. People are actually hiring these hackers that, that are so amazing that I've been following. And of course they are. If you show that you're really interested in your topic, if you show that this is a passion that you look for, and especially if you show that you're doing things that no one else is doing because it's interesting to you, people want to hire you. And I think it goes a lot further than that. It used to be, if you wanted to become an engineer, you'd follow a very predictable path. You'd go and get a university degree, you'd go and get a job where you have to wear a tie to work, and then you'd stay in that job and work your way up until you retire. I don't think that that really works anymore. Things are very different now. For one thing, people don't generally stay in the same job anymore. But even more so, people don't even stay in the same career anymore throughout their working life. And oftentimes, we hear stories of people that are going to university where fundamentally things have changed when they've gotten out of, out of school. And so we need to be looking at formal education in a way that it really is teaching us to learn. It's teaching us to be able to teach ourselves. And I think throughout university and in your work life and, and until up until retirement and beyond, you should be working on your own projects. And I think it's really important that you talk about those projects so that other people can learn from them and you connect, you connect with others that are experts in that field. Um, these are some of the case studies I'm going to kind of skip through quickly here. Sorry about that, just because of time. Uh, but for instance, this guy, Zach, amazing work with his hand soldering on this picture. He built this ring out of PCB. You shouldn't be able to do this. It's kind of amazing. He founded a company that uh, uses these little boards to mimic neurons in your brain. And he ended up bringing this all together and meeting the right people, and he landed himself a research assistantship at the Center for Bits and Atoms at MIT. Interestingly enough, MIT actually has a creative portfolio as part of the you can choose to add to it towards your admission to college, and I think that's something a lot of universities should definitely adopt. Another person here got rejected for graduate study a few years until he started building his own um, devices, and now he's at Wadamaya University of Washington. And these two guys I met at Maker Faire, um, they've been building these projects now they're applying for their college. And you can bet they're going to get a leg up in picking an engineering school because of the work that they've done. 
Uh, like at the beginning, I talked about during the offer of getting a job, a lot of opportunities open up. If you write in depth about your 3D printing and amazing things can happen, like you might get hired by Form Labs. That's a great place if you're 3D printing aficionado and you want to work. Uh, this gentleman uh, has a couple of semesters of college. He was working on guided uh, rockets for the model rocketry. He ended up with a job at Goddard Space Flight Center. And I hope everyone's heard of Jerry Ellsworth. She's done amazing work, including um, teaching you on YouTube 10 years ago how to make your own uh, silicone, silicon chips in your uh, garage. She has founded Tilt 5, which I think is on the cutting edge of augmented reality. So what we're really talking about here is being able to show off your work. Because when you're locked into an employer, locked into a company, you can say, I've worked on this product. You can't show them the code. You can't necessarily show them exactly what you did on it. Doing your own projects allows you to build a portfolio that shows your skills and can open a lot of doors. What we're really talking about is open sourcing your creative creativity, open sourcing your interests. And that allows people, when they're looking for a particular skill, to track them down. It also opens up things like if you need funding for a startup, people can look back and be like, this person has engineering skills, this person's passionate, they know what they're doing. And of course, it's a great path for getting into university. And I, I do think that formal education is still very important. And I think it's getting more and more competitive um, for the best positions. Um, I really like this quote coming from the space race. If you think about um, everything that's going on now with like, the second space race, we're getting to see engineering development as it happens. And what that does is it energizes everyone across society. Science belongs to everyone. And so the more that we can do to share our passion and share our creativity, the better we are for those people. Thank you very much for the wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Steve. Thank you. Thank you for talking about open source so much. It makes me happy. Uh, I would like you to stay on stage right now because you, you uh, turning uh, a passion into a job is something that happens quite rather frequently in the different world right now. So I want to hear two more stories of people who are doing this, who did this. And I'd like to call on stage uh, uh, Jason Wang by 9 o'clock and uh, <laughs> And the education market is a little bigger and the consumer market is much bigger. 
But uh, and, uh, in micro marketing, there are so many companies uh, doing well, like Smartphone, like Evergood. So uh, I think that if I can do something in education marketing, that may be uh, much more of that potential. So that's that's our way of uh, start. So in order to solve this problem, I, my solution is that so first I want to provide an integrated platform, including mechanical, electronic, and software all together. Because if you want to build something, you need this kind of solution. But uh, before, these areas are always separate. So I started from the mechanical, you know. I, uh, uh, so uh, I uh, designed some mechanical parts using metals in the so you know, uh, work similar way like, like Lego. And uh, on the mechan on electronic side, I'm using Arduino, but the uh, wiring of Arduino at that time is a, is a, I think it's very complex, so I, I want to make it simple. So I use uh, some easy to use connectors, like, uh, like a, uh, phone connectors. And then uh, on the software side, I still use uh, Arduino. So that's the first generation of the solution. And uh, so then I, with the demo, I joined Hacks. So Hacks nowadays is one of the biggest uh, computer in the world in focusing in hardware company. Yeah, and uh, so Hacks help, help us a lot because uh, we are a Chinese company and then we uh, have Hacks help us to go outside China. And um, then I launched our project on t So at that time, so that's the year 2013. So we raised about uh, 18,185,000. That's the start point of, of our business. And then I, I try to, so I have some investors and uh, I try to uh, hire some more people. And then another direction is to build the strength of, of, of for creation. Mechanicals, electronics, software. How can we make it easier? And then, so, so on the software side, I connect Scratch and uh, Arduino together. So, programming is always you know, uh, a little uh, complex. So, with graphic programming tools, <laughs> we can make it easier. And uh, so that's uh, so we try to make hardware and the software easier. And uh, then we got. Uh, a product called m -Bot. So this is very suitable for schools. So we make particular ordinary particular may be a bit harder for, uh, for students to use. But with some easy wiring with graphic programming tools, schools can start to use open source hardware to teach robotics. And then m -Bot, now is uh, maybe the most sales uh, robot in, in the education area. And uh, then we, uh, we continue to, to uh, follow this direction to try to help people to create, to provide a solution on the mechanical, electronic, and the software side. So on the mechanical side, we are now not only provide metal parts, we provide other uh, plastic and carbon uh, materials, and also we provide like laser kind of machines. Like 3D printers, and uh, on the electronic side, we also have a different type of, uh, much easier to use electronic modules. And uh, on software side, we we integrate Scratch and Python and uh, some some other way to easy way to program. So yeah, so that's our story to help people to create. How many people work for this company? Now we have uh, uh, 560. 560. Yeah. Can you hear me well? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, congratulations. <laughs> yeah. So, our company is now, uh, so after we raised about 44 million uh, uh, US dollars last round, so, and the valuation of the company is about 400 uh, uh, million US dollars. Congratulations. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So, when you put your story, it sounds like a, a bridge between very different worlds. Uh, starting from Belgium to China and bridging uh, industry to makers in JavaScript. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Uh, Buonasera. Uh, my name is Ray Kuduk. Uh, I'm originally from Belgium, um, but I, uh, I moved to England to study there. And through my job in England, I kind of felt that being disconnected from the manufacturers is not good for me. The good design is going to be very close to the manufacturers. You can see how the manufacturing goes, you can optimize your design for the manufacturing. 
So after my graduation, I moved to uh, China. I worked in Beijing for a renewable energy company for two years. Started my own company in the electronics field. And then I decided that I had to be in Shenzhen because Shenzhen is the higher capital of the world. So for electronics mass manufacturing, I should be in Shenzhen. So I moved to Shenzhen. I've been there now for five and a half years. And at the end of this year, I'm moving back to Belgium. So I'm going full circle. <laughs> So yeah, Shenzhen is the hardware capital of the world. It's a uh, production of our products happening. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. You can go in, uh, in the factories and actually go in discovery and stuff, talk to the manufacturers. And in Shenzhen, there is a market called Hua Chambe, probably you know those about. It's uh, the biggest uh, electronics uh, market in the world. You can find any component you want. I call it Electronics Valhalla. It's the heaven of electronics. And basically, if I'm designing something new and uh, I need a specific little connector, I can just five minutes walk to the market and find hundreds of different suppliers of this connector and really feel it, try it, talk about volume, and straight away get the design going. But much of that is also developing and reinventing itself. That area in the past that was a factory area became a market. Now you can see it becoming like uh, retail and malls, so it's constantly in development and changing and going higher in, in the, the supply chain and the, uh, the value chain. So, uh, going back to, to the product that uh, I designed, so the idea was it came back from 2007. I built uh, for my father, I, when I was still a student, I built an RFID access control system based on an uh, indoor NG. I sold it on the airbones port, and I with a lot of wires basically uh, connected everything up. Um, but I had to build a lot from scratch. And I thought a lot of people must be having the same issue at the moment. They build something and then they want to install it permanently, but they really have to reinvent the wheel each time. So, uh, what solution to have both from like red port spaghetti, trying it out, and then installing it permanently? So, what does that one need? You need something convenient that you can install it uh, reliably. You need uh, robust circuits that can last many years. Uh, it needs to be certified. And everyone is using certain features that everyone needs. That there's only to reinvent each time. Like everyone needs a mic controller, you need a clock, and you need a, some kind of user interface to display data, to change parameters. And all the rest that's custom, that's always different. So that was the birth of industry, obviously. Uh, we made a bunch of a platform where we have a, a top board, which is the heart, which is a, a NCD microcontroller. That's always the same, and the LCD for the, for the user interface. And then the base board, that's customizable. That's your I.O. part that you can basically even change at each time depending on the project. So basically, we have two platforms based on that, industry and proto. Uh, there you can put your own components on the, on the prototyping area. Um, and then in the streaming I.O., it's more like a ready-made, like a PLC, where you can connect to industrial level sensors and actuators. Uh, so 24 volts, 45 milliamps. Um, so a lot of kind of sensors and actuators that are already used now in this industry that are made to long, last for a long time and that can work over very long, long distances. And you can connect them to the industry and I.O. So a few examples of use cases. Uh, one of the first things, the very first things we built on our own product for ourselves was a watering system for our plants when we go on holiday. So we call it the holiday gardener. So we just took an industrial proto and we put some MOSFETs on the baseboard, connected eight pumps, and then uh, programmed the time sequence and just kept our plants alive as we on holiday. And this is a project of one of our customers, Nicholas Humphrey. He built a lighting control system for his house based on the industry of the So this is because you can control 24 volts, and also you can control relays, dimmers, uh, kind of, it's directly compatible with what's industry already, what's out there in terms of modules and levels of standards. This is a, quite a recent customer that uh, can build a product based on our product. So they rebrand our product, and we use it in a bigger system to uh, automate 
irrigation systems uh, in agriculture, so they can monitor the pressure of the pumps, uh, use the, the, the app on the phone to, to schedule the watering of the plants, get some warning if the pump fails, or the, the water level is too low in the well, for example. So that's kind of a, a product based on, on our product. Uh, this is really interesting, it's a university, and it's a Rice University in the US, and they use our industry to uh, basically automate their uh, research. So they, they uh, do uh, 3D printing of uh, vascular structure and uh, issues, and uh, to, to the aeration of the system, they use the stream to basically create uh, uh, profiles, of, uh, pressure profiles to activate these issues. And it's very nice, and uh, the, the, the leader of this lab, John Miller, is always tweeting about how he's using the stream for, for his project, and it's, it's very nice. It gives a lot of positive energy and boost to Thank you. Thank you. And so bridging makers in the industry and yeah, yeah, yeah. to work with enough applications. Yes. Uh, we have no last time left. I would like to ask Mike Sish to, to comment on these two stories. I have no time for more questions. But, uh, how do you see this, uh, uh, this combination of makers in industry and also connecting uh, different worlds like China and the rest of the world? Whereas, do, do we need to move to China? <laughs> I think anybody should be able to be a maker company no matter where you're located. And I don't think that we should exclude one area or another. Um, I really think it's interesting looking at James's company, uh, Makeblock, uh, combining Scratch and Arduino in there. And um, you know, obviously, one maker at a time is one way to learn. But I think it's really interesting if we take these tools, Arduino's been used in schools, Scratch's been used in schools, and we start pulling some of the hardware into that, then we give teacher buy-in, and we start to normalize like everyone. The same thing with industrial automation, I mean, that's something that's been very close. You buy a module, it goes to the factory, it does a factory sort of thing. And now we see uh, with the industry, you, know, you have the ability for people to use it at home. Like, when you think of home automation, you don't think of these industrial automation controllers, but why not? If we have the ability to program them ourselves, we have the ability to build our hardware for them, it seems like a perfect match. And we're still talking about the personal technologies. Yes. This is the great challenge actually to make a company on open source technologies and build up on, on, on that. Would you like to, to comment on this? This is more of it. So, um, so, yeah, so I think the technology is very strong today, but uh, not only, uh, but only a few people, a few makers can use the technology to create something. But what we do and what we make uh, uh, do is to lower the threshold of using technologies. And so what we focus in education area, we, uh, we, we try to provide very easy to tools, easy to use tools to students, to teachers, and then so teach technology, not the final goal. The final goal is that to give them tools, and then they can better to uh, solve problems, they can better create new things. Yeah, that's, that's the uh, value, and that's the, also the, the main value. Yeah, yeah. that's the one to say. Thank you. Oh, yeah. One thing that very, very interesting is to see how some of these platforms end up in other platforms and then people need other platforms. So I think one of the powerful things about open source is an enabler. So it enables people to apply to different fields. And obviously, if, if we keep open sourcing what we do, then this is gone forever. So I think it's very important to constantly contribute back to open source because it's kind of a it's an ecosystem that if you start, stop supplying in a way uh, open source innovation, it kind of dies. But if you do it, you can see how platforms can kick off other innovation that you can support innovation. Okay, so thank you everybody for this uh, short discussion. Thank you, 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 thank Trovati con gli aggiornamenti del Digilencio Break and Pay 2019 di Roma, Simone Sardi, Sim, Studio, partiamo subito dall'autorità. Break and Pay 2019, carica di fango, un disegno di esce nel massa planta e 3D la fa esplosere. Sacanati a Rani USB senza la rimozione sicura dell'acqua e fa esplodere il condominio. Uomo spinge un corto fiocco troppo in fondo all'orecchio e si resetta le postazioni.
azioni di fatto. Arriva in Italia l'acqua che mi impedisce di mandare messaggi da sbronzo. Germania è inaugurata a centrale Green, alimentata dalla gestionale degli italiani. Apple diventa più green, il nuovo sistema operativo tra quattro cestini per la differenziata. Ingegnere alza lo sguardo e scopre il giacimento di energia solare. Giovane riesce a rimorchiare a bordo di un'auto elettrica. In arrivo recupera il servizio carico di Uber. Ha una lezione al volante della sua Tesla, l'autopilota lo porta a Mignon. Scandalo Mega Save, Robot ha sorpreso a presa con uno smart frigo dietro allo stand. Ed è tutto con gli aggiornamenti di Gilecio Mega Fair 2019, grazie per averci seguito. Sono molti collegati, queste, queste realtà, facendo capire diciamo, quali sono altri modelli. 